you're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussion, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Law. Welcome to the show, everybody. Well, I should say welcome back. Our second show for the day on a Friday evening, your host, Michael Lofton. Going to be joined by Dr. Matthew Minard here in just a moment. He is back by popular demand, and he's going to be continuing his lectures on the Summa Theologica. He's going to be getting the uh, Secunda Secunde, uh, and he's going to be doing a lecture on the theological virtue of faith. So again, Dr. Matthew Minard coming up next. Dr. Minard, how are you? I'm great. It's great to be back. It is good to have you back. Uh, we, uh, now, I know we had the show a few weeks ago with Dr. DeClue, but um, prior to that, it, it's been a while. So it's it's really good to have you back and good that we're uh, continuing this series. So I'm excited yeah, to have you on. Get life in line. I had to deal with some yeah. family things. You know, at the end of the semester, I've got five courses right now because I have a oh, deacon wow. course online. So like I, you know, I just chose the straw and said, oh, I'll do it after around Pascha. I'll do this Deacon course. So I've got my, I've got my normal, I have to do a four load usually. So it's busy, but all's well. F five courses. Wow. Um, and just curious, are these courses that you've taught before or just brand Everything, new? everything except for, I've got that one based on the new Val Theology stuff I'm doing. Okay. So I'm, and I'm at the point because some of the family stuff really got me like behind on doing my forward recording. So I am recording basically week to week for that. So I usually try to do all that ahead of time, online courses like that. So yeah, I've got, yeah, I've got a, a intellectual history around Vatican II course that I do, uh, social doctrine, uh, what my intro to philosophy. I could teach that thing off that course for the seminary off the back of my hand, our classical. Right, right, right. Um, we were doing Palamus stuff today, actually. It was fun. It was, today was our last lecture. Um, yeah, the Nouvelle class. And then it's a, a bioethics class online for the deacons mm. and it's it's really like a half a class you know mm. it's it's the deacon students have a four-year program in the Ruthenian church and we get some ukrainians who come um so COVID. And, and i'm curious how, how many videos per course do you normally have to do i mean that sounds pretty overwhelming yeah the uh the deacon courses are just one per week and it's like an hour and a half or something like hour and 15 minutes i think is what we do to get the amount that we do when they're normally on campus because it's a week mm -hmm. it's a two-week program we do one week long courses uh, mm -hmm. each year um yeah i do two i usually do two videos to get into the the two hours and a half of lecturing that i have to do oh, um, wow. yeah so i'm at the here as i come to the end of the semester and we're just now we did the nouvelle stuff we're actually reading a bunch of different either a few eastern catholic and a bunch of orthodox writers on theological methodology um so for that kind of thing i can do a little bit more of sitting back and smoking and you know pull up the pdf share the pdf we don't have to make i don't have to make slides because i can just sort of reflect on what we've talked about on the forums and all that so you can get away with that a teeny bit more in a, a semi seminar class like that uh <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't have I won't have a snifter of brandy. I, I think that uh, Father Robert or uh, the rector or maybe Father Father Christian might find it both amusing and also something to come down on my neck for. So if anyone's seen, <laughs> by the way, guy. I'm oh, go ahead. <laughs> He's a big enough guy. I don't want him coming down on my neck. So. Oh yeah, I've I've I've, I've, like I've, I've, I've heard. <laughs> he played. I don't know if he played football or something, but just a yeah. You know, I've, I've heard he's pretty big. <laughs> what are those? I'm just curious. Those There's some new books that I see on the wall. Uh, oh, good I think not. I think no books. Truth be told, in the green room, we did not talk about this, but this is uh -huh. part of the uh, part of the, the shtick of having them up there, right? So yeah. there's a, on the right there in the kind of orange is is this guy, actually. I just was citing it for something. Uh, mm -hmm. The American Maritime Association does volumes every after every conference. So we had a philosophy of nature, philosophy of science, uh, a conference a couple years back as the editor for the volume. 
Okay. So anyone who's interested in topics of topics concerning philosophy of science, philosophy of nature, a couple of really good essays. I mean, I don't want to prejudice against any of my other authors that were in here. Uh, it's an invited thing. They invite someone to to do this, and we go we go through the membership to do it. But the the essay on facts, and also an essay by a guy named Jack Cahalan, who he went to Notre Dame, had a PhD from Notre Dame, and then he became just sort of independent. He got tired of academia. Uh, they're great. Those are really good essays. Those those essays are spot on. Everything else is very good too, but I very much liked it so much that I named it. I stole something from John Adams uh, and uh, named it after one of the the essays in there that I think unified the volume really well. And then since Camus, uh, Gary Lagrange's where it's going to be uh, called what to Mystic Common Sense. It's at the printer, so I thought, okay, if I'm ordering stuff online, these these things, I can get get the plaque for it as well. So that's coming out mm -hmm. in June. And then I'm going to have I'm going to have my moral theology text up here pretty soon too. The cover cover for that I'll have. I still don't know what I'm allowed to say. Like I have to keep some of that un, under my hat until it's done. But we are going to do pre-orders. It's a significant Catholic press actually, um, starting in July. A lot of good stuff coming up. It's busy. It's busy. I've been caught the editing. I can tell. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> covers for two other books from CUA Press, but I'm going to wait until the catalog comes out before I put them yeah. up. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then De Revelazione is something like 750,000 words worth of copy editing. So we're we're almost through Volume One, and and it's it's on task for December. But boy, that's like every Tuesday and Thursday morning till my kids wake up. That's I check the copy editor's work. So. Anyway, yeah, that's 700,000 words. Oh, it's huge. Yeah, I can't remember. I don't want to blow it up. That's what I'm trying to keep it down. I think it's closer to a million. But uh, first volume is at least 400,000 Latin words. And the second volume, we have them both together. It's a great. You know, I, I'm doing looking at it again. De Revelazione, uh, which is going to be related to today's lecture, actually, because it was a <clears throat> treatise added to the Cursus of Studies after the time of Aquinas. Um, and it was particularly after the 19th century. But it's Garrigou's text. It was his fundamental theology text. It's it's kind of before theological sources, you would treat the problem of revelation, the question of revelation. Um, and it, I didn't realize how much it had influenced me on tons of topics because he, hmm. you could see his mind as he did a couple of the editions, working out some of the synthetic things that people like Congar, who who would have been influenced by him, would never want to admit that they were actually picking the baton up from him. Like, right, mm -hmm. footnotes that, that they're not explosive. They're not going to overturn Thomism. But all of a sudden, there's some, like, flash of insight about the, the layout of theology. Uh, you know, it's just he, he had it in that text because he taught that revelation course for so long. Um, so that, that text, I'm really, really excited. Not as excited as I am for the moral theology text, though. That moral mm -hmm. theology text, which is totally popular, is I, I think it turned out really well. The editors have been really good with it. Got some really neat, um, whatever you call them, blurbs. But you know, uh, yeah, it's been busy. But you noticed, you noticed all on his own. I did, I all did, on his own. <laughs> I did. <laughs> it caught my eye immediately. <laughs> Why well, I put them up? I spend money on them. Good, I can. It means it's an advertising deduction now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, it, it works out well. So there you go. Well, I'll, I'll let you take it away. The theological virtue of faith. Faith. All right. Well, oh, I thought maybe you yeah, were yeah, just... I'll, I'll, yeah. If you if you want, I'll I'll let you take it away as far as the lecture, and, and I'll I'll be here, but I'll I'll just yeah, let yeah, you I be the only one on the yeah. screen. Yeah. Faith. Yep. It's good. All right, faith. Well, you know how appropriate at this point you would think we would have prayed at the rest of our lectures. So how how academic of me um, that we hadn't, but we really should at least open the prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, everywhere present and filling all things, Treasury of blessings and Giver of life, come dwell within us, cleanse us of all stains, and save our souls, O gracious One. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Well, welcome back to those of you who have been at the the other lectures that we've had so far on the Summa Theologiae of Thomas Aquinas, and you know more broadly on the topics in theology that are covered in in the particular topics that we're we're talking about. Because you know I do bring in things from other elements of theology and other other thinkers or other aspects of the tradition to try to to try to uh, unify them uh, into the the topic uh, that we're talking about. If you haven't listened to the other lectures, you're fine where you're at. Um, <clears throat> we're picking up now with what's called the Secunda Secunde of St. Thomas's uh, Theological Summa. 
And of course, I, I'm interpreting St. Thomas primarily through the lens of the later Thomistic school, um, in particular, those who would, would have uh, you know, planted their seeds in the heads of people like Reginald Garrigou Legrand, Jacques Maritain, uh, who, who else? Yves Simone, uh, Michel Labradet, Jean Hervé Nicolas, Michel, uh, uh, Michel Joseph Nicolas, um, and others. Um, Juan Arantero, Ambrose Garday, very dear to me as well. So I'm interpreting St. Thomas in, in, light of, in light of the later school. And I, I do that because I, I want to think about Thomism not as merely going back to look at the texts of St. Thomas Aquinas as though they're just some letter that we have to sort of find the answer in, but rather to approach these texts as the living source of reflection <clears throat> on the truths of faith. So we're talking about faith, which is, it's weird. Where are we in the Summa and why in the world are we talking about it? You know, this many videos in, we're like nine videos in to our discussion, right? We've talked about theology as a whole. We've talked about the Trinity. We've talked about the one, well, God considered as one. We talked about some of the theological metaphysics and, uh, and whatnot of creatures, of the angels, of man. Tiny bit about evolution. We talked about... <clears throat> the basic principles principles of morality about beatitude human acts and, and conscience and above all christian conscience uh we talked about i'm going to do before grace because we kind of got tied up and did a couple things there so I, I pulled bits about part we did an overview of the virtues duh so we talked about the big scope of the virtues which i'm going to give a tiny summary of today so we can make sure that we know exactly where we're at here <clears throat> And uh, we talked about grace and grace and the law. So here we are now at, it seems like we're starting over again. We've talked about all these moral topics. Why are we now still in, in this long, huge middle section of Aquinas and Summa? Well, <clears throat> Aquinas has this, this very systematic layout to the way that he's, he's doing his theological enterprise. It's eminently theocentric. The Thomistic theology is eminently theocentric. The most central of mysteries that really guides everything should be the mystery of the Trinity. And this can have certain detriments, which we'll leave for other talks. So, you know, each method has its, its upsides and downsides. But the synthetic ordering of the Summa Theologiae kind of descends from, no, it does descend from the light of the Trinity, which explains to us the place of the procession of creatures, which is all the rest of that first part, which is the context for understanding the, the destiny of the human person. And then all of that is under, uh, needed as a background to understand the mystery of Christ who communicates that life of grace as a share actually in his, his own grace um, <clears throat> as the head of the church to all believers. But Thomas wants to make sure he covers each thing in the right order. And he, he's, he's sort of been frustrated with how topics are treated, you know, in the theological studio of his time, they're all out of order, not, not the repeating things too much. So he's set it up this way. So why are we coming to yet more in the virtues, right? Didn't we talk about the virtues already? Well, <clears throat> in the first part of the second part of the Summa, or what we might call the first part of the moral part of the Summa, St. Thomas treats the general properties of these more general notions, virtue as such. How is virtue divided? What is virtue? How do we use the word virtue uh, or the notion of virtue to apply not only to those moral capacities that we have as humans, the kind of thing that the philosophers would talk about, one would find it in the Nicomachean Ethics, one would find it in the writings of the Stoics, on the better days of one's life, um, well, on the better days of the, the life of analytics, I should say, although I'm not a big analytic philosophy guy, one finds it in analytic virtue, the, virtue uh, philosophy, virtue ethics. But also, too, how does the notion of virtue help us understand something about the life of grace? <clears throat> so he's concerned there with the general properties that apply to all of the moral virtues, to all of the theological virtues, precisely as such. It's a very Aristotelian method. He goes from the general to the specific. And for this reason, sometimes in old theological manuals, 
or even theological texts that, that predate the late 19th century, early 20th century manuals, one will find the prima secunde referred to as general moral theology or even moralis generalis, general morals. You'll find this even in philosophy texts as well. Because what you're dealing with are the general notions of sin, virtue, passions, the beatitude as such. Now, in the secunda secunde, the second part of the second part, we co uh, cover the specific topics. And for this reason, later theological manuals would come to call this sp special morality, uh, moralis speci specialis. Well, what's meant by this special morality? It means the various species, so a genus is a general category, the various species of virtues. Well, what are the virtues? And for this reason, the overall structure of the Secunda Secunde is broken out not by commands, yes and no, what you're permitted, what you're permitted to do, what you can't do, what you must do as a duty, but rather by the virtues. Now, this is a very Aristotelian methodology on St. Thomas's part. And he begins with three treatises on the theological virtues, which we'll be taking up our next three lectures, faith, hope, and then charity, or love, divine love. This is followed then by a series of articles on the various moral virtues. And I generally follow, although I think it's still a little bit unspecified in St. Thomas, the approach which I believe is that of Cardinal Cajetan, uh, the commentator, the famed commentator on the Summa Theologiae, <clears throat> that St. Thomas is here not talking primarily about the, uh, what do you call it, the acquired moral virtues, the natural moral virtues, but he's talking above all of what are called in the tradition, and we'll return to this in a couple of weeks, you know, when we come to talk about these virtues, the Christian moral virtues or the infused moral virtues. We talked about this a little bit before, so you can go back and listen to the uh, virtues lecture because he's doing theology. He's not merely doing philosophy. Now there's a ton of philosophy in here. He's at the same time as he's writing uh, sections here of the Prima Secunda and Secunda Secunda, he's got right before him Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics and he's commenting on it to try to pull that text apart very carefully to, to lay out what Aristotle's position was so that he could hone one of his many instruments that he deploys in, in the midst of his uh, theologizing. You know, he doesn't just use Aristotle, but it's a big structural thing for him. So here we have the treatises on prudence, justice, fortitude or courage, whichever you would uh, wish to call it, and temperance. And then after that, he considers various states of life. And we'll come to this uh, perhaps as we round things out. Uh, this is a great example of something that, that is open for further development because in, in many ways it's concerned above all with you know, various states of life, with the religious life, the ordained life. I think this is the place for also speaking of matters of the laity um, and, and the spirituality and the virtues as applied to the state of life that is the lay state. Well, faith. The first three treatises here then of the special section of morality. <clears throat> we start with faith. Are we Protestants? What is faith? Well, my, my wife recommended to me, I said last night, what do you think I should lecture on the faith? I mean, I... <laughs> I've been planning some of it, but you know, I wanted to, I wanted to hear from, from the people. And uh, she said, you should think about for, for those that you're lecturing to the various senses that we have of faith. And it's important to, to take heed of, you know, the philosopher, Joseph Pieper, who's written all of these beautiful little books on, on classical philosophy, we'll say he's influenced by Plato and Aristotle and by, um, <clears throat> as well as St. Thomas, he's, he's written uh, a series of books that were gathered together by, I think, Ignatius Press. Yeah, they did a, a set of volumes, Faith, Hope, and Love, Faith, Hope, and Charity. I can't remember if they used charity or love. And he reflects on the reality of faith, hope, and love as primarily philosophical or, or, or in a philosophical manner, we, we could say. Now, you, you got to be careful when you do that. Pieper, I dearly love Pieper. He has a tendency to kind of reach around between theology and philosophy sometimes. But he has a good analysis of the notion of faith from a very human perspective. Let's think about this. We think of faith 
as meaning trust. I put my faith in such and such a person. We'll see that that kind of trust, what would have in the days of like Luther been fiducia almost, uh, how it would have been put. And it's in Thomas like that too, actually. Fiducia uh, in Latin, trust, maybe you could say trustworthiness. Well, it would be more like trust, not trustworthiness. Um, trying to think, I also, I have a couple different translations I use for it. But the idea of trust seems to be what faith is. I put my faith in someone else that they will do something. You, you know, give a statement of good faith to someone. Okay, that's fine. That's that's a usage we have. And it's very important to be, wa be aware of the fact that language today is going to have resonances that aren't the same as a more technical vocabulary is going to have. This is going to be very important that we keep this in mind. But there's something that we want to keep, I think, accept from, we want to accept, we want to keep, uh, you know, accept with an A from this idea of trust. Faith immediately says to something, something to us that I will choose, I will put my will in such a disposition that I trust, I accept, I will to uh, take a stance regarding something I can't control. Okay, so however, like I said, that's gonna be, that's gonna, that's too nebulous. That's closer to, to the theological virtue of hope, we'll say. Well, let's go back now and let's think here of another, another domain in which we put faith to use, even humanly, something that Peeper makes much of. It's been a while since I've read the text actually, but I, at least it's how I remember reading it. Uh, that he has one reflection in there about how the teacher is someone in whom the pupil puts faith. Ah, let's think, let's think what this is like. So, you know, instead of me thinking about teaching my, my seminarians, let's turn our minds instead, like, I don't know why my mind goes back to high school. And I think about, you know, whenever I, well, I was thinking of a chemistry class, actually, but even better, uh, geometry class. So all of us who've had a, you know, high school geometry class, remember doing, you know, proofs, they give you the proofs and you have to, you know, you write, you know, I use the side angle side theorem. I use, you know, this or that theorem to show how two triangles happen to be similar, uh, or congruent. Or, you know, you first learn the, uh, Pythagorean theorem, you know, maybe at the end of, a end of a geometry class or somewhere in the geometry class, I guess, not the end. Or you learn some of the, um, you know, basic trigonometric functions in, in a class like that. Well, do you really know the, the content? Do you really know why the Pythagorean theorem works even remotely? Or do you take it on trust from your teacher? Now, at its barest level, what the student would be learning to do is how to shift around symbols on a piece of paper, right? To just kind of grind through the problems. But you can also learn at a very superficial level and have knowledge of something based on the knowledge of your teacher. But an immense amount of trust is placed there in order for you to have some inchoate knowledge. Another example of faith, though, and I'm going to circle back to the geometry example. Another example of faith would be um trying to think i'm lost thinking of the geometry thing but I'll, i apologize so all right anyway uh because I, I have a memory that that's very vivid there that i thought maybe i could i could use to remember all the details of but think about whenever you have someone tell you about somewhere that they've traveled and they tell you details and details maybe my my stepfather rest in peace my stepfather could listen to details from other people and himself sit and sort of bask, thinking through what that experience must be like, trying to appreciate that experience. I, I just remember how how much he he was like that. He, he loved he loved the idea of of living through other people's experience that way. And it's not the same as experiencing it, right? People come along and say that's not the same as as experiencing it, but. That kind of affective communion with another person really trying to take in, 
especially based on the shared experiences that the two of you have, their experience, you have a kind of knowledge. It's obscure, but a kind of knowledge about what they know. Somewhat also, this is like the the uh, reality. I'm just coming up with this one off, off the cuff, but hey, it's it's good to be live and to try and think this stuff through. It's like whenever you're reading a book or even watching a movie and you try to take in what is it like to experience some happening in life that you've not experienced. You know, we were watching, um, it's kind of, you know, kind of, <laughs> kind of snobby, I suppose, but we were with my, my in-laws, they're very down to earth. So it was the doctors, I guess, who were imposing this, but we, we all, we liked it. The, the movie, um, oh, with Sir Anthony Hopkins in it, The Father, which is an interesting and very like, it's a very well done movie about Sir Anthony Hopkins. Um, and I think they do put this in the bill, so I'm not spilling any beans. Um, you stick fingers in your ear if you so desire. Um, that he's, he's suffering from dementia and it's from his perspective what this is like. And there are certain glimpses you get of the experience that the, uh, the you know, daughter has and so forth. And he himself, um, that, that even if you've never cared for someone like that, you, you see what it would be like to care for someone like that, but you've never had that experience. That's a little bit less. I mean, it's a different kind of thing. But there's a sort of knowledge that's involved there as well. You're listening to the story of someone else, in this case, presented with great detail because it's a movie. And you come to have a knowledge that you really don't have, though. Right? You've not had it. I mean, I, I've, I've done a little bit of care for my, my grandmother, Minor, who was in part ill with, with uh, dementia at the end of her life. Um, and, you know, I've been through some of it, you know, but it's not quite the same as the lengthy experience thereof. And so based on my experience of caring for my parents and for her and, and thinking through all the details, you know, you, you, you have an affective communion with the person who tells you this tale. Trust me, all of this run up is very important because it's going to get us, it's going to make the jump for us here. The important thing is now let's go back to the geometry is that faith provides a kind of knowledge. So I knew the Pythagorean theorem. I knew these various trig identity theorems, right? Like when I was in geometry. But then after I took my trig class right next door, you know, so we had Mr. Rudnick and Mrs. Winslow, because we live in a live in a great world of, of uh, Eastern Europeans where I, I grew up. Uh, Mrs. Winslow was, I think, even a Greek Catholic, a uh, Ruthenian Catholic. Um, but, you know, I guess Winslow might be a, 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 a British name, but she definitely was uh, Slovak or Ukrainian. Uh, but so I'm in Mrs. Winslow's class and I prove something we had with Mr. Rudnick. And I just remember how it, it all of a sudden I saw, I had knowledge of what I had heretofore known, but I knew it in, a, in an obscure way that involved a lot of moving the pieces around. Right. That's what a lot of that first learning is, is learning how just to do the equations. I mean, I knew it. I remembered it. I saw how it fit in together with other things. So it made sense. I had a kind of faith, geometric faith. But now I saw. But now I saw. Or at least somewhat saw. But what I had before was a kind of knowledge. Faith is a kind of knowledge. And this is very important. Faith is not merely a trust. It is a kind of knowledge by which we assent with, however, the will being involved. That my relationship with Mr. Rudnick has shown him to be voracious. It's shown him to be trustworthy. And so because I've found him to be trustworthy heretofore, I have then you know, placed in a way, placed my trust in him so that I may have a kind of knowledge. This is what faith is, is this kind of knowledge. Now, the resolution of faith. Where does faith, how do we, you know, how do we buttress our faith and how do we come to faith? Faith is not based on any amount of reasoning. Faith is not even something that is in our power. Even the beginning of faith, we cannot merit. 
But instead, it is a gift that comes from on high. It's a new kind of light. It's a new kind of sight. It's for this reason that baptism by the fathers in the early church, and it's reflected in various liturgies as well throughout the, the church, uh, was called illumination. Long before the, you know, long before the Bilderbergs, the Christians were the true Illuminati. They were those who have the new light, who've received the new eye to see. This is a theme that one finds, um, you know, popping up throughout the patristic era. It's clearly, you know, there in the air. And I, the only reason I, I have this break is because of something that Lubach wrote. But still, it's something I take for granted that it's a new site. So it's, it's a this is a datum that that one can do a study of, but it's there. It's an acquired thing from early in the church. It's there in Saint Paul even. That faith is a new kind of eye, a new opening of our mind to revealed mysteries. But why do we believe these mysteries? And I'm going to have to circle back around and talk a little bit about reason here. But let's let's elevate our hearts for a second so that we see what faith is. I believe <clears throat> because I've had the experience. Now, not really, pro you know, this can happen without explicit baptism. But let's talk about the normal case. Because the church has proposed to me, yes, but that's not the reason I believe. Above all, I believe because God has revealed to me and spoken in the depths of my heart as he has drawn me into the communion of the church, who is indeed the condition for faith in the sense that she proposes the object of belief to us. But the formal motive, the reason why I believe, the very thing that will color all of faith, is this what we could call faith trust, because we want to distinguish it from hope. This faith trust in the God who reveals his inner nature as well as his providential plan. All of, all of the mysteries are contained within those two nuclei. And those nuclei have existed from the, the beginning, even in the state of that first fallen time, after after the garden but it was obscure and it had to fully develop in its revealed form and yet in an implicit manner the people of israel or even before them but especially the people of israel knew that there was a one there was a god and he, that he was a just remunerator or that he was a loving and provident father of his people using father in a very general sense here that he was a provident god we might say a loving and provident God who is just, all of that together. In other words, we had the mystery of God and the mystery of the economy of salvation, or as the Greek fathers would just call it, theology, the Trinity, and the economy, salvation history, or the entirety of God's salvific activity at extra. Those two great mysteries will contain all the others. Those two great mysteries will irradiate the, the mystery of the Trinity and contained in that basic thing, that basic statement that God is the loving, just, provident God. We have the entirety of the redemptive incarnation, the entirety, the history of the church, the entirety of the moral life of Christians, the entirety of the sacraments are all subsidiary to that one great supernatural truth. But notice, be very careful. For even Israel did not believe those truths merely as the philosophers do. I'm not against philosophical knowledge of God. I'm not against the philosophical knowledge that God is just, that God is provident. God even is merciful. The philosopher could tell you this. And let's even presume that they did, even though they had a hard time doing it. Yes, that's something the philosopher can tell you. But when this is known by supernatural faith, it is known precisely as being revealed by God himself. The I by which we see is God himself. The theological virtues, if you remember from our, uh, our lectures on the virtues, are like an irradiation that grace undertakes 
lifting up and elevating our minds and hearts, or to use good scholastic terminology, our intellects and wills, so that we might see as God sees, but in a participated way, right? Only God knows God as well as God can know God. That we may place our trust divinely in God's providential care, theological virtue of hope, precisely because of God, hence it's theological, and that we may love God, yes, in a way that is participated, somewhat limited, but yet nonetheless fully divine through the theological virtue of love, which will be a kind of capstone by which our will is driven onward into the mystery in its greatest depths. But it all begins and charity is fed as though by its divine mouth, I believe Father Ambrose Gardet said, by the theological virtue of faith. Faith is a substance of things that are hoped for. Faith is also the substance upon which charity will be born. And in its perfection, all three of these virtues ought to, by rights, flower in the, in the creature under the movement of the gift of grace. The creature can prepare for this. The creature can, the creature can beseech God in the highest of acts that the creature can really do, short of contemplation, and arguably in some ways, perhaps higher, prayer. Because contemplation is cut to our size. Contemplation, whatever is known, is known according to the mode of the knower. Some of you might know this old maxim. We know things after our manner. We know even infinite things in a finite manner. But by prayer, which is something that is even merely creaturely, even he who is in a state of mortal sin can pray. And although it does not have the power of, that comes from charity, it does have the power of prayer, impetratory power. We extend our hand humbly, open, instead of holding on to tools so that we can build things, and rather await the gift of grace from he who alone can give it. And one can wish to believe, one can look at all of the motives of credibility, as the theologians called them once upon a time. One could consider, even at the time of Christ, the very miracles that happened during Christ's life. One could consider the miracles to continue as well thereafter. Or, choosing something that's much closer to us, one could look at the way that all of the aspirations of human nature and more are fulfilled by Christianity. How Christianity, as proposed by the church, of course, has the loftiest form of spirituality. And Christians should be, you know, shouldn't shy away at that. One can be sensitive to the riches, yes, that exist in other religions and even the seeds of grace that perhaps act there to draw people to Christ, yes. But it is only in the light of the great gift that is given through Christianity, that you have the most sublime of spiritualities that can incorporate everything else without herself, without herself changing. And the highest and greatest of moral teachings and more, the whole moral teaching of divinization, something greater than even the, 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 the loftiest Neoplatonist could imagine. All of these belong to the teaching of Christ. It seems striking and the church Despite her many vagaries, she is, of course, the chaste whore, as the uh, famous statement of, I believe, Ambrose of Milan would say. She shows a meretricious side sometimes, and yet, through the ages, continues onward with so many good works and self and self sacrifice by her members. So lofty a teaching and love for humanity. So lofty a love of God and and turning away from self. That this also stands like a kind of moral miracle in the course of history and makes it all seem, all of this makes it seem eminently reasonable to be Christian. And yet, as the preacher Lacordaire, the great Henri Dominique Lacordaire, if you haven't read him, go read him. You can find the stuff online now. As he said, in a couple, there are a couple of beautiful passages. It's, it's very much in the air when he's writing. 
as he uh, remarks, it's like the man who stares, you know, or prays, we'll say, you know, is praying, thinking to his God, I wish I could believe I see the, the greatness of the martyrs. I see the greatness of Christ as a person, his spirituality, the greatness of the church, and how I wish I could believe. I've heard people say this. I've heard people say this. Even people I don't know. You've heard them on podcasts. I've heard someone say this. And I don't know what's going on actually in this heart. But it seems striking to me like someone who has come to the, the edge of the motives of credibility. And yet still stands upon the threshold of reason. They still stand on the threshold of it's eminently reasonable. Super eminently reasonable. And yet, all of a sudden, one day, I don't remember when, Lacordaire says, was it when I was sitting by the fireside, when I was crossing the street? I was new. I was like a child. I believed. Now, this is, of course, the anticipation of the grace of baptism, so-called in voto, by desire. Sometimes it can be very implicit. The issue for another day. The idea, though, here is that all of the sudden, the eyes are open and we are, we are then moved into the domain of re redemption. Now, this ideally is something that, yes, occurs in the process of... of uh, you know, preparation for baptism. And of course, one must get baptized or else that vow, that, that desire for baptism is not a real desire. And it, it brings the sacramental grace to its, its full completion then. But I experienced this once with someone that I was catechizing where something he said just struck me and swept me away about the sacrifice of the divine liturgy or the sacrifice of the mass. I uh, just, uh, yeah, I remember I thought, yeah, he's got supernatural faith. He has it because he's, I mean, because he truly has the desire for baptism. But of course, one must complete the process. And once again, leave that for sacramental theology, why that's necessary. Faith is a new supernatural vision, not merely because it is in line with the highest aspirations of human reason, but rather because it I don't want to say bursts open, but it opens up from within what is called the obediential potency that we have. This openness that, however, could never imagine what it's actually even going to receive. To the life of grace, which then illuminates the mind. And by which then the believer knows truths of faith in a, a supernatural way that cannot be shared with the person who does not believe. And this is why also that theology among non-believers is nothing but a host of opinions, a corpse. Academic theology that is, that is not illuminated by faith is but a corpse and is not theology. It is no surprise to change slightly something I believe from Garrigo. It's no surprise that the people who have apostatized, think that theology is nothing more than the collection of a bunch of academic opinions. Because it, in fact, is nothing more than that in their own minds, he said. Well, interesting. Now, whew, stentorian rhetoric, right? We've got some other important stuff that we're going to say. But I want to step back, actually, do a little bit of methodological history for you. Because it's on my mind. And it's also going to be on my wall eventually when we talk about on Revelation. But I'm not doing this to sell a book. So it's interesting, we're here in the moral part of the Summa, and St. Thomas is, is dealing with faith here because he wants to deal with really the, the, the doorway to the perfection of the Christian life. Now, unlike, yes, unlike what would be a position like become what becomes classically Protestant, we have to keep going, right? It's not merely faith that justifies, it's the entire gift of grace, faith, hope, and charity, which is the gift of God and for which we can merit an increase, but we cannot give it to ourselves. So the whole theology of merit is operative here. But it must flower in hope and charity as well. But we're doing this in the moral part of the Summa. But we've talked about a lot of stuff that would be nice to have done before this, right? 
especially given that we live in an age of skepticism. We live in an age that, that, that more profoundly than even 100 years ago is concerned, or I shouldn't say concerned, is uh, wary, we shall say, of the powers and capacity of human reason. It would seem human reason is capable of, you know, getting along and muddling along, but to, to grasp necessary and absolute truths, eh, everything is context dependent. It's turtles all the way down. Turtle after turtle after turtle. It's but text upon context upon context floating on the surface without an absolute. All is relative. You have your truth and I have mine. This would seem to be coin of the realm. We're not at a, a high point of the absolute truth of the intellect culturally. Well, because of this dynamic and this is something, right, that's going on from throughout the entire modern period with its systematic doubt, with its idealism eventually, idealism in the sense of we can't get beyond the ideas that we have, that we're trapped in, in our own mind in some sense. In its empiricism, its reduction of all of our knowledge to empirical facts, nominalism at the best, what we can know is a universal name that we give to particular experiences, but knowing universal essences, no, 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 poo-poo. It's the story of, of so much of modern philosophy. And then, of course, it's correlates come with this. Laicism in politics, universal skepticism in culture, and even naturalism and rationalism. If there is religion, it must be, to get my Kant off the shelf, within the bounds of mere human reason. That's, that is the true faith. Get your Jefferson Bible out. Ah, Jefferson goes so far as to get rid of the miracles. He gets rid of not only what's supernatural essentially, but what is supernatural modally, as the, as the scholastics would say. Well, must we consider these to be the limitations of reason? We must, as theologians, defend the possibility of faith. We must also show the interstices of reason and faith. Where does this happen? Well, there develops in the, uh, in the history of theology a separate treatise. And it actually gets moved to the head of theology. But there's a real pedagogical issue here. Take another hundred years to sort out. Very often, it's, it's best to, to, to learn the methodology of a discipline by going through and doing it, right? You go through the course of studies as an undergraduate, and you just, when things are organized. So this is like, you know, I was a computer science major. It was my primary major. Was, uh, theology was my, my second major. You, you could do this in math, too, as a math minor, but I you know, can't say what it's fully like the whole way through. But computer science is like, was like this, where there are tons of things you learn. I mean, not merely by doing them, because that's a big part of often learning computer science. Um, but you learn the particular subjects without reflecting on the nature of computer science. I mean, computer science is still a discipline that doesn't really know if it's separate from other disciplines sometimes. You know, we're moving there. Well, same thing for theology. You, you should theologize by, by learning a systematic theology and then critically reflect on the nature of that knowledge with, by the hand of a master who helps you. And eventually, you know, you become conversant enough to have a critical grasp of what you had ostensibly known heretofore, somewhat by faith, actually, uh, by educational faith, but that's a different thing. Well, that being said, if we kind of presuppose someone who knows their, knows their content on the whole, it makes sense that you need to do a critique of knowledge somewhere, and you can do it at the beginning of your discipline, or you can do it later on. I sometimes think you need to do it in the midst of it, but that's a, that'd be like rewriting theology, to be honest. But the, the important point is, is that this happened in metaphysics because of epistemology, in at least the better, the better Thomists. Um, the critique of knowledge was, it grew out of the fourth book of the metaphysics in Aristotle. And sometimes it would be covered right before metaphysics. Sometimes it would be covered in the midst of metaphysics or after it, that you would critique knowledge because knowledge is a kind of being. It's a form of being. It's a way of being with other things intentionally. So you have the critique of knowledge. Well, something similar happened in theology. And so if you pick up an old manual series of theology, 
you'll find at the head, De Revelazione, Tractatus De Revelazione, the treatise on Revelation. You'll also find, uh, out of place, Tractatus De Ecclesia, the church, it's, uh, or or the Tractatus De Vero Religione, the treatise on the true religion, the treatise on on the church. This is is slightly misplaced, um, and uh, it was. It's I don't know who first really came to this insight, but you do see it very crystallized in Cardinal Bo. So not like you know Bo, but B I L L O T, uh, taught at the Gregorianum. He's famous cardinal uh lost he lost his cardinal head actually um but in, not a thomist on all things either um critiqued by thomists on on things but to his credit uh at least it crystallizes in him that the treatise on the church needs to go as we talked way back when in our introductory lecture it needs to go in the treatise on the incarnate word because the church is the mystical body of christ but because we had to push back against rationalism, skepticism, idealism, and so forth, denying the possibility of revelation or implicitly denying the possibility of revelation in movements like ontologism, for instance. A treatise on revelation was instituted at the head of theology, along with a defense of the true religion, because the church is, now theologians do actually differ on the formal motive of faith, but thinking of it from a strict Thomas perspective, the church is not the formal motive of faith, but is the, the sine qua non condition thereof, um, at least implicitly, um, because the church proposes the object of the faith. You need a treatise on, on the church, at least enough to tell you about the church as proposing the faith, and also to deal with the problem of dogmatic development, things of that sort. The rest of the, this, the church's intimate nature should be put off into the proper context theologically. Now, that being said, very often that stuff got glommed on historically. The tre treatises on the, on the church were just a mess at the turn of the century. Uh, Gardet talks about this. It's, they just glom on all kinds of extra stuff. There also was instituted from the time of the Spanish scholastic Melchior Cano, De Locis Theologicis, or on what we could call theological sources. It's actually based on the language of topics from Aristotle. How is it that we draw sources of theology. And this is part of the long and, and still going on struggle over the, the constitution of positive theology um, as distinct but unified to systematic theology. But the theology, what are the sources of theology? Uh, and that treatise was really, though, notice, really presupposes faith, right? You really need to already presuppose that the, the person who's learning theology here, who's listening to the theologian, is it takes for granted that supernatural truths are possible. But the treatise on, on uh, Revelation is interesting because it's a kind of apologetics on behalf of faith. It's an apologetic that supernatural knowledge of God is possible, that it's also eminently credible. Ah, it's like telling reason that it's believable on reason's own terms to accept what the church says Revelation is. Even though the church also says, and this is why it's a theological topic, the church says it's more than that. It goes beyond reason. It's not the discursive conclusion of some chain of credibility. It rather comes like a light. And yet it presupposes, and really through the life of the believer, this must go on too, the ability to show the reasonability of faith, to strengthen the human affirmation of faith as well as that ultimately divine affirmation that supernatural faith is. That treatise on, on Revelation is a theological treatise. Faith must defend itself against those who would deny its possibility. And the true notions of faith, of supernaturality, of revelation are all necessary among others in order to form the right defense. But apologetics of this sort would be yes, by reason, but under the guidance of faith, and hence it is a theological uh, task. And it's here, like for instance, in the, the great lengthy chapter 14 of the first volume of De Revelazione, you find Garigou, Father Garrigou Lagrange laying out masterfully the distinction between credibility and the ascent of faith, as well as a sort of summary of the adjuncts that follow upon that. What are the implications of the supernaturality of faith? 
But here in the moral part, we're concerned with faith more with an eye not to its credibility or even its distinction from credibility, even though those things are taken for granted and are talked about, for instance, by St. Thomas in this treatise. Oh, but instead, in terms of its, its bearing on our moral life. Now, you could also talk about, for instance, the issue of doctrinal development here. I think that the, the place for that is probably more like that methodological stuff at the beginning, though. Very important topic, though. Very important topic. But if we're going to move here, as I try to get us to move toward the, the end of our, our lecture, I'm going to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit as they are related to the theological virtue of faith. What is more, though, we should quickly bear in mind, everything is dependent upon seeing the essential supernaturality of faith. And actually, give me but a moment, and I'll do the gifts, uh, gifts of um, the Holy Spirit. My wife, holier than I deserve, she made the point to, she said, make sure that you, you, you prevent this from becoming too abstract. Well, see if that happened. That being said, how, how do we exercise faith? You see, there's a tendency in, in certain circles, and it's, you know, the literature is not bad, but the language is inexact, to talk about mental prayer. As though external liturgical prayer is somehow not mental. It's, um, what was it? Uh, I'm trying to remember story that Ambrose Gardet tells about, you know, he, he was, there was a Jesuit visiting his convent on St. Saint, Saint, um, Dominic's Day. Dominicans put all the stops for, um, for St. Dominic's Day liturgically. And the Jesuit said, you know, this is all nice. It's a kind of like after effect. It's good. Um, you know, but I prefer five minutes of good mental prayer to any amount of this, this sort of thing. Maybe I'm slightly doctoring the tale a little bit. And the the father, or maybe it was Garde himself, said in response to the Jesuit, he said, well, that's all good, provided that the external prayer, the vocal prayer, is not mental as well. Liturgical prayer is mental, can be mental prayer as well. Mental prayer does not necessarily mean just the fact that it's something that you happen to say in your mind. You must be careful. Prayer, whatever its form, whether it's fully meditative and inside your, your spirit or is um, external and, and supplicatory, is ultimately that. It's, it's, you know, it has a, an element of thanksgiving. It has an element of uh, kind of praise. It has, above all, though, the character of being a supplication, asking for something from someone who can provide it for you because you cannot provide it yourself. That's the essence of what prayer is, strictly speaking, in traditional or classic theology language. And it's actually very important to make that distinction. Father Fenton, um, of whom some of you may know, has, a, has an excellent text on this. And there's a section, actually, very good section on this, in, and it's compressed in Father Ambrose Garday's The True Christian Life. Uh, I translated it. It's coming out from CUA Press at the end of this year. Not trying to hawk my books. I assure you I don't make very much money off of them, but I do do them because I think they're good texts. I try to find good texts that are a good experience for me and for others. Well, we tend to use prayer, though, to also talk about other things. And this is what mental prayer is getting at. We meditate on the mysteries. We read the scriptures and we, we take in and savor the meaning of the text, how salvation history and the mysteries themselves are revealed to us in this loving reading of, of scripture. We meditate on the mysteries of the life of Christ if we pray the rosary. We even, you know, meditate upon our lowliness when we pray the Jesus prayer. Our dependence upon God and our sinfulness. I would say that even could be partially an act of hope as well. Because what am I getting at? In all of these various forms of prayer, as well as, yes, just silencing the heart before God, but let us not forget the place of meditating on scripture also as an act of faith. An act of faith, a supernatural act. Do we read scripture as though, in a sense, we were God acting through us? 
God has given us the divine eye, obscure, participated, creaturely, but yet supernatural, to know supernatural truths at will, because he's given us a new will to do this. Do we practice that enough? When we are at church, and I get a certain smile, I apologize, and we pray that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, or the Father and the Son. We know and have covered that ground ourselves, and you've heard about it much. We know the meaning of both of those terms and how they're used differently in the Latin West and the Greek East. Whenever we pray the creed, whichever form we're praying it, do we appreciate, this is true, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I really want to be serious here because I think about this all the time when I canter, because it's so easy to get just rattle through the creed. Yeah, I got to get going. Yep, okay, it's the melody B, go ahead and go. We are, are we speaking in the depths of our soul, but also speaking with our lips, for we are creatures. The mystery of the Godhead. Like, the church has given us this great gift. We can just rattle off the life of the Trinity. I believe in one God, the Father, Almighty, Creator. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's just, you know, do we really take this into account every time we pray the creed? Like, from the depths of our heart, do we, do we affirm those truths? And here we can see the role of the will, which is not merely willing it. I mean, it's a love that we accept from God who has revealed to us through the great gift that has been the life of being baptized in the church. And she's meretricious, you know, right? And yet, what a beautiful place. The place of grace. She has given us the ability to say these words, not only externally, but in the depths of our soul, to make an act of faith. You can make an act of faith, like the classical prayer. I don't want to poo-poo that. One iota. I believe in you, God, because you have revealed and you are all loving. You know, you are all good. You give you give me the eye of the an eye to see and perceive the very mysteries of yourself and of, of the salvation you have offered to the world. But we also make acts of faith through, you know, the prayer of the church in the liturgy and liturgy of the hours. And liturgy of the hours, we at once pray in the strict sense of prayer, and we also make an act of faith over and over again as we meditate on these words of the Psalms, on these texts of you know, canticles, also these texts of stichera like we do in the, in the East as we read the scriptures, other selections, especially in the West with the patristic selections. Do we do, we do this in the praying of the creed and so forth? That is what faith is like. Do we do we read? Do we do spiritual reading? Not so we may understand. Not merely so that we may have some scientific-ish knowledge, theological science. You, everyone knows that I've got my problems with that language, but you know what I mean. But so that we can have the interpersonal knowledge that faith is, that we may see these truths that God has revealed to us. Do we read the fathers and meditate on catechesis of the early church? Letters of the early fathers and so forth. And see there and affirm there and make the rules of our life, the guiding rules of our life. These truths of faith. So you see there, it's interesting. Faith has this twofold nature. It's as a, as a word, another distinction that actually mentioned it to my wife last night that's taken me this long to get to it. It is at once the objective content, you know, uh, all Christians of the true faith, all Christians who believe the true faith, or depending on your translation for Melkot, all, all Christians of the Orthodox faith, all Christians of the true faith, the faith teaches, but faith also has a subjective sense. Subjective meaning not that it's not real, that it's not tied up with reality, but subject is it is in me as in a subject. It is in me as in its metaphysical abiding place that I am given a light and an eye so that I may elicit, I may call forth from my divinely elevated mind acts of contemplation. Acts of contemplation. But there we see now 
the wings that must lift us up high. Because yes, we can elicit these acts, and yet they are acts that are concerned with the revealed mysteries of the supernatural life of God, whether in himself or is communicated to us in the order of the economy. And this is why the theological virtues require the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas lays out the gifts of the Holy Spirit using, yes, the language of uh, the Latin Vulgate of his day, um, and texts then drawn from the prophets for that and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But also, too, he uses Aristotle to try to, like, parcel this stuff up. You know, I, I've, I think it's profound, especially the treatment of understanding and wisdom in John of the St. Uh, I'm sorry, John of St. Thomas, the commentator on, on um, Thomas Aquinas. So I'm just I'm going to just think a teeny bit. We don't have very much time along his lines without saying that we have to quite parcel things up this way. And yet it, it does work. It gives us a, a, a good good lay of the land. And I, I want to consider the two gifts that are connected with the theological virtue of faith, namely the gift of understanding and the gift of what is called knowledge. You see, they're taking that from Scientia. And that's going to lead, that last bit is going to lead um, the uh, reflection that the later Thomas have, as well as Thomas does, on the nature of these gifts. But we're going to be very brief. You see, the gift of understanding is the Spirit's gust of breath that enables us to see not merely in this almost, you know, there's a, a humanness to faith. The obscurity of faith is the human side of faith, that we trust and assent to these truths that are unseen, but we desire to have some experience of them. And ultimately that will come through the gift of wisdom by which through a loving contemplation, we experience ineffably God in a quasi immediate way by which love passes over and takes over the condition of being the very object of knowledge. That'll be really a driving thing in our discussion of charity. But the gift of understanding enables us to purify our grasp of the truths of faith so that we may know the true and full meaning and discern them from error. Not in the sense, though, of, and this is the Aristotelianism of knowledge or science that's scientia, that's bothering Aquinas and then his tradition. We're not, we're not discursively doing anything here, even quasi-discursively. It's merely a discernment of spirits in the, in the sense of faith that we discern truth and error, that we see underneath any of the, the uh, secondary properties, the very truth of faith that we must know. Well, we need the eye to see that readily. And that actually comes not merely from faith, but from a kind of experience that involves a profound amount of, we could call it faith love, that affectively moves us to assent to the truths of faith just like any old grandmother, as we say, any old Baba could do. Any old grandmother could have this profound experience of the truths of the faith without being erudite. And there are two passages here. Um, couple here. There's another one too. I, I thought I had it marked. Um, John of St. Thomas. I mean, it's really profound. It's a great section. I was just working through it a teeny bit here to, to prep. I forgot how excellent of a section this is. But he says, it is most proper to the gift of understanding to render the heart lofty. It elevates the mind to a sublime kind of experience, penetrating and understanding divine things. The mind knows that they vastly exceed all that can be in any way compared to them. It's actually, the gift of understanding is like the apophatic gift of the Holy Spirit stripping us of our created modality of faith. Because really the created modality of faith is on our side, but the object is supernatural. However, from such a loftiness of heart, the heart itself is not vainglorious. Acquired knowledge too often puffs up the mind to its ruin. He says at one point, he says, you know, ha having a lot of uh, philosophical knowledge and also theological knowledge can lead to, to mostly to vanity. Through the gift of understanding, the mind is raised up so that it may exalt and God may be magnified. The soul then knows that it is God alone 
who is great and not itself. And then another wonderful text. I thought I had, I thought I had marked it. Um, perhaps I won't, but it was, it's a beautiful text about the, the negative, um, the unknowing of the gift of understanding. It's really beautiful. So when anyone ever tells you that Thomism doesn't, isn't sufficiently apathetic, um, they can pound salt about that. That's just nothing more than coming up with polemics. Um, well, anyway, I don't have that, but let's, a couple of examples actually are given here. Um, it says, under words, so the words of the, the truths of faith that are given to us through the church's teaching, there are various hidden meanings. Here's one I said to my wife, I said deviously right before I came in. It is proper to the gift of understanding to attain a knowledge of the proper and literal meaning of sacred scripture. Then he opened their minds that they might understand the scriptures from Luke. How many exegetes of scripture have have really would openly say at the even at the Catholic Biblical Association of the importance of the gift of understanding as a spiritual gift to do their task in academics. I don't know. We've uh, modern exegesis isn't a pretty thing. Under the figures or enigmas of the literal sense lie hidden uh, mystical meanings, such as the moral, anagogical, and allegorical senses of scripture. Just as parables lie under likenesses and similitudes, you must have the spirit to help you see and penetrate readily and quickly. Meanings that are divine, hidden under hidden in, in need discernment. Beneath the sensible appearances lie intelligible and spiritual things, such as angels and gods, known after only the removal of imperfections. This is the idea of the, the negative side of this, that we remove the imperfections. We must purify our faith so that the words, which are important, we never will get beyond the formulas of faith, but we will see the spiritual realities through the signs, through the words and not be tied too much to their creaturely resonances, that we go beyond the human mode of having faith, which is already supernatural, to a truly divine sight given in a, a supernatural mode, even by the, the gifts of the spirit. Effects lie hidden in their causes. Grace, grace is concealed as the res tantum, as they would say, in the sacraments and redemption and all of its effects in the passion of Christ. Do we look upon the passion death and resurrection of Christ to see the fullness of the redemption all contained right in that one mystery. Need a sight, need a sight that can help us get beyond all of the human discursus to see that mystery. And sometimes ca uh, causes, uh, causes envelop their effects under the effect of divine predestination that we experience in life is the infinite abyss of God's judgment. The gift of knowledge is somewhat more uh, discursive. We have to learn how to look upon the things of the world and see their relationship to God, but we must start, you know, we can see them either from God's perspective or in themselves. We can know created realities that are involved somewhere in the great symphony of salvation history. And we need to do this because we're creatures, but we need to see their proper place and how they lead us to God. Even in the, you know, even consider like meditation on the liturgy and how we see in this nexus of signs, the divine realities. And yet here, the fruit that is, uh, or not the fruit, the beatitude, the act that is involved here, St. Thomas says, is sorrowing. Blessed are they who uh, sorrow. And that's an interesting fact to say, because what does, why in the world does blessed are they who sorrow, blessed are they who mourn, deal with the gift of knowledge? Well, because in, if we're going to have a right knowledge of creatures, above all, what we'll see is their deficiency in relationship to God. But we must have a divine eye for looking through history, looking through our lives, looking through created realities, and looking through the created realities of, of uh, even revealed truths to look upward to the divine mystery and yet not get lost and attached to those things. It's an immense task 
and yet spiritual authors all will attest whether or not they use the language of Thomas Aquinas to the idea that God comes here to our aid, to lift us upwards so that we may not be tied down in these created realities, but might, might rather ascend back upward to he who is penetrated or to him who is penetrated through faith so that we have then a kind of indwelling of souls that gives birth to hope and charity, which will be the full flowering in our will of the gift of faith, this supernatural vision by which we then march forward in the life of theosis, the life of divinization, the life of God poured out into our hearts to make us new so that we may truly be remade in the original likeness that now has been even more eminently recast in us through the gift of the grace of Christ. So, Michael, questions? Thank you for that. Um, now, the first one that I'm seeing here is from River Run. Um, <clears throat> I'm about to teach the parish the three ages of the interior life. Does the professor have any supplementary material you recommend for this? That's a huge bite off. That's a hard text. So just you need to be. I mean, it's a great text. You're going to need to be aware, depending on your readership, what they are ready to to, to digest. Supplementary material. I mean, of course, there is that little volume on the three conversions by Garrigou, which is going to give you um, stuff that's maybe a little bit more digestible for the people. Um, you know, you might find certain topics that, that Farrell's commentary on the Summa is going to be really readable for. So whenever you hit certain topics, you can look up the Summa section and go look up Father uh, Farrell's com companion to the Summa. Uh, will we'll be a kind of down-to-earth version that's very faithful and that would be good. Um, not to hawk my books, the 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 essay on um, the essay on uh, divinization in Garday's book that's coming out late this year is very useful. Um, and then, yeah, I'd have to think, heavens to Betsy. I mean, one of the reasons I wrote a moral theology book is that a lot of this stuff I cover in a very lay language in the book that I have coming out. Um, I'd start though with the feral stuff. Um, and I would try to make it your synthesis. Just try to make it your synthesis, understand the material and make it your synthesis. And then you'll have to find texts. You're always welcome. If you look me up online, drop me a line using my, uh, my little, uh, area, you know, the message area, I'll give you recommendations. I'm more than happy to do that. Like I'm working on this. What can I give them? Or I got this question. I'd like to lead them more. I'll help you with that. Don't give them Aquinas' texts. I think it'll confuse them. It's too dry. I do not, I, I'm not a big person who's a believer in doing that. They need teachers. People need teachers first. So that's your role. That's my opinion. Chris Isley asks, uh, how do you talk to people who use reason only? Point out it's a form of reductionism, materialism, or use simple logic like reason has limitations. So pure rationalism is in fact irrational. Yeah, and I mean, this is this came up in one of your uh, topics because there's something in in uh, evangelical apologetics that's that runs a lot like this. It's not my world that I'm as familiar with. Um, well, it depends, of course, what you're referring to. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a believer that reason by itself is irrational, but reason that says that it's and not it's not just reason, but right, right, it's a whole metaphysics, the whole view of the human person is what you're implying here. Reason and philosophy that says that the human person is closed off to the reception of the, the gifts of grace, not necessarily that it, it can anticipate it, but it's closed off to it, that is actually irrational. But of course, you have to try and show someone that it is, because you need to show them that they then have, they have a bad theory of knowledge. They have a bad theory of what the human mind is. Um, I don't necessarily think you'll catch them in illogicality directly, but you have to try and find some open premises that they that they're going to want to concede about the transcendence of the human mind that that then they keep backing up against that you show them that they actually are denying it by their pure rationalism it's very hard though because a lot of people are they are irrational in their account of reason because they're nominalists like that's the biggest thing is you just run across people a lot of people are just pure old nominalists who don't believe in any essences of any sort whatsoever um 
And I mean, that's where you'll show their irrationality. So what you're doing is a reduction, you do lots of reductions to absurdity arguments is what you do. Lots of reduction to absurdity arguments. Here's your position, you take it, look at the absurd consequence. And then what you often try to do is find something that they believe that they really want to hold on to and show them how they're denying it. And then that's an irrationality on their part. Um, Dr. Miner, when Jesus said, men of little faith and your faith has saved you, when he did miracles, how does this correspond to the theological virtue of faith? Can it increase? Yeah, can you leave it up there for me? Because there are two things, there are two or three things going on in there. Um, of course, I'd have to go, you know, have to look at uh, the, the exact text. So, I mean, yeah, the doing of miracles, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because there is the side where he, he, he laments, you know, the Jewish people are demanding miracles and Greek, you know, your heart, you know, you won't believe for that reason. But it does, it's, it's, clear on the whole that of course Christ is doing the miracles in order to lead people to faith, not merely to, you know, not merely to heal the blindness, but to give them the true sight that comes through seeing him active as the Messiah. So the miracles are a testimony to his, to his divinity. So that's, you know, that's this whole idea about just at the level of reason, actually, um, attesting to, to the power of Christ active, you know, that then leads to faith. Now you have little faith, um, think about, you know, the, the famous, you know, Lord, I, I believe help my unbelief, right? Faith absolutely can increase. It's a, you know, it's a virtue, but it's not a virtue. That's the language that's used often, I should say, in scholastic circles, but it's not a virtue like acquired moral virtues. We can exercise acts of faith, but only God then. Now, there's a whole theology of merit, which we're not prepared to talk about today. Uh, you can merit an increase in faith, but only God gives the growth that, Faith, yeah, it could increase. Faith could increase infinitely until until the day you die, and then you could live. You could live a million and a half, three billion years, and your faith could continue to increase. This one is from Armand. What are your thoughts on Jean Luc Marion's views on faith and revelation? Armand, it's a great question. I apologize that I'm only so I'm only so much. Um, of uh, have been exposed to Marion. I have a friend. I was just talking to him today. He's doing his dissertation on Marion, um, and I, you know, I only know a bit about the philosophy of givenness. I read his uh, oh, his critique of Thomism. Right? What is it called? The God, God beyond being, or whatever. And I found it to be so unfair of a position, a pr presentation of what the real Thomist position was, like especially like the developed Thomist school, that I I, I had a hard time taking. I, not just taking it seriously, I found it to be, you know, very difficult to read, and I just never took an interest again. So I, it's, it's a, I mean, I'll just flat admit, I know that that's a, a bad place to be, um, but you only have, I only have so much time in my day. Um, my friend is very convinced that, although, you know, as he, as he spends time doing the Marion literature, that Marion, you know, his denial of, you know, classical metaphysics is in the end deeply problematic. And I don't think that James would have been there once upon a time. He was so frustrated with Thomas, understandably. Um, but he's convinced that, you know, Marion's account of revelation and of, of if it's, you know, it's relation to the, um, you know, to the other. And he's got this whole bit, right, that's, that's very Cappadocian about, you know, the icon and the idol. Uh, there's bits of Barth probably in there too, though, that's coming to him from uh, his connections to the Comunio people, but he's convinced that Marion is very much operating within the domain of intentional existence, objective existence, the existence of knowledge itself, which would be the interior side of subjectivity. Um, but as for what that means for the revealed, the revealed act, I've thought about reading those texts more than once. The, the ones that specifically deal with revelation actually, um, and just have not had the, not had the time. Uh, maybe whenever I don't, I'm not under this pile, I can do, more reading that's not just course prep and, and things related to my work. So thank you for pushing me on that. The next question is from Mike. He says, Dr. Minard, how would we balance engaging with theology and also realizing what St. Thomas said, that on some level it's all but straw? Yeah. Uh, theology itself bores and faith does this, of course. Theology does this because theology has its root in faith. Uh, it bores into the soul you know, a desire for mystical experience. Um, this is, yeah, I just think that any theology that doesn't 
that doesn't express itself somehow, both rhetorically and then personally, in a way that that passes over in silence and wants to get done with the theologizing, it risks being um, pathological. Really, you know, I, I I lived some time as a Benedictine for three years, um, and I don't have the like twelfth century hatred of scholasticism that the Benedictines had. Um, but I can easily see myself, oh God, by my fifties, I don't even know how I'm going to want to do this stuff anymore. Right. I, 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 I don't, I mean, maybe I, it's God's calling, whatever I'm going to be doing, but you know, I, I yeah, I, I miss even now. I mean, I'm so tired of words. I really am, even though I have to deal with them for my work. Um, you know, it, we are discursive creatures. We must give some understanding of the faith, some intellectus fidei. Um, we must be able to answer objectors. We must be able to show, you know, show the interconnection of the mysteries. And yet on some level, it really should just show you as you experience these points, just, I mean, how much it'd be much more preferable to spend, you know, to spend an hour with scripture is better than a whole week and a half with, with this stuff. Spend to spend it meditating on a text, a great homily by one of the fathers, right? Which is really something that is, le- if it's done in a style of Lexio Divina, is is in the end contemplative. It's much better. And yeah, I, I the less academic it gets. Maritain once said, "Scholastic philosophy, and you could say this for theology, is known by the name of the period of its gr- of its greatest trial, because it was scholarly." <laughs> Right. To be scholarly is a great trial for sane theology. And this also, I mean, this can become a kind of latent critique of even the method of St. Thomas. I'll admit that. So, but he himself saw this. It's a great question. It's a great question. If you can't feel the contemplative spirit of theology, it's not worth its damn salt. I don't know if that makes sense. Salt, but you know what I mean. It's not worth, it's not worth a pound of anything. Um, this one is question on mental and vocal prayer i've seen some orthodox claim that mental prayer such as having mental images is not spiritually advantageous does this sentiment exist in the ruthenian tradition ah uh, i would presume it does because I mean, well, here's what i can say i know it does because it's me i feel that way so yes it exists in this ruthenian this ruthenian though tends to be not uh not a uh indignation by bent um you know, there's a good example. Mental prayer became that's so it's such a weird phenomenon of the the overly psychologized period of mysticism that you see in that that period that, that gives birth to the Ignatian stuff, that gives birth to even you know the Carmelite treatises, which we would be all the worse without. But you're presenting mental prayer as yeah, fully imaginative. That's just the that's just one more thing that's like vocal prayer. Right. Vocal prayer can be, I mean, yes, out loud saying the same things over and over again. Right. Or it can just be the expression of whatever the faith is. Right. If you've ever been to an Orthodox and I'm guessing this is coming from an Orthodox thinker, actually, the way it's put, which is great. If you if you uh, if you've been to Orthodox services or at least decent Byzantine services, there's a lot that's on your lips. You don't ever you're never really quiet, especially if you're the cantor, you know, but you're just in the warp and woof of meditating on the mysteries. Right. Well, okay, if you're forming images in your mind, you're just doing something imaginative that's like vocal prayer. The real contrast here should be between, you know, meditative prayer that's leading to acts of faith, hope, and charity, which should ultimately have a bent toward imagelessness, right? You should want to get away. You can't throw away all images because that you can fall into kind of errors that could be quasi-Messalian. And yet you should want to purify your contemplation and let God purify it by getting rid of those images. Um, you know, on the other hand, mental prayer or vocal prayer, there's prayer and there's contemplation. End of story. I don't like the distinction between mental and vocal is what it comes down to, right? There's contemplation in faith above all, sometimes hope and charity as well. They're all, it's all mystical experience, um, or at least the preparation for mystical experience, or there's, you know, vocal, ah, there's prayer in the sense of prayer. Prayer is actually technically an interior act as well. It's not the vocal side. And so it's, and I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at this distinction between mental and and vocal prayer. It's an accidental distinction. Prayer is supplicatory. So you've got supplication by which you ask something from God in a, you know, in a way that's befitting with all the praise, et cetera, that you give him. 
or you have meditation, which can be both, yes, imaginative, but then also, you know, non-imaginative, silent through various practices. I mean, that's much more the orthodox way that would be, I wouldn't even call, I wouldn't even call it prayer. I know that we call it prayer. I wouldn't call it prayer. I would call it acts of faith, acts of hope, acts of love. And then as the spirit comes, it would be the gifts of the spirit operative in, in those. Sorry. <laughs> so I just, cause I find all that weird. I, I, you know, I'm fine. Right. I grew up in the Roman church, so I'm not going to like go pour acid on the rosary, uh, you know, but I do find, you know, overly imagistic prayer weird. I, I just do. But some people must, I mean, it's got its use. And I mean, I'm in the Lexio Divina, which is image, imagistic in its own way. So I'm not going to make too big of a, of a deal over it. But I share in the in the frustration there is all. I'm going to get I don't, I, so. <laughs> but join the club. I, I don't <laughs> I don't see any uh, any other questions. So we'll, we'll leave it there. Dr. Minard, I appreciate you doing this so much. It uh, has really blessed us all. I can also tell in the chat it was received very well. Uh, what do we uh, have to look forward to next time? So we're doing hope. We're going to move, move on down the chain. Um, we'll look at the date. I think we can all find. Um, but, yeah, we'll be doing the theological virtue of hope. So we're just moving down through special theology. Excellent. I look forward to that. And, uh, you know, uh, any any parting words before we uh, end here? Parting words. Um, do a little bit of lecture to Dana. That's all. Okay. okay. <laughs> That'll be much parting words. <laughs> Good deal. Well, again, thank you for coming on and doing this, Dr. Minard. Always an honor to have you. And everybody, thank you all for your participation there in the chat. It was very uh, good, and you all asked great questions, so thank you for those. And, of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support us. Till next time, God bless you all. <laughs>